particularly here in this country, people might know so much about the First Amendment. There's an interesting historical aspect to it, of course, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, after the War of Independence and then the setting up uh, uh, of the federated states, if you like, uh, coming together as a, the new republic, there were huge tensions. It's not unusual for there to be very deep divisions in American society. In some ways, as a former practic practitioner of, of, of politics, that can be a very good thing as long as there's basic respect for the other person and a willingness to negotiate. So you had the anti-federalists um, lining up against those who felt that America needed to you know, set up what we now call America, I suppose you'd say. And the anti-federalists needed some assurance that this new power center would not take away individual rights, as I understand it. And that stood behind the development of the First Amendment way back in what, the 1780s, 1790s? Can you just give us a feel for it? Because history is important. Oh, yeah. No. Um, it's kind of sad because when you look at how um, on, on campus and in high schools, American history is taught, it, it, it's all, it's become, unfortunately, extremely negative. When I think, you know, I'm, if you're a constitutional lawyer, you're proud of something about the United States. And for a lot of Americans, what we're proud of is our Constitution. And we should be proud of our Constitution. Um, it, to a large degree, uh, the lessons of the horrible religious wars of Europe um, were very uh, were burned into the brains of our founders, thankfully. Um, and a lot of those uh, those problems that you saw in the old country in Europe, um, you know, they came across to 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 the U.S. as well, but in an interesting form. And, and partially, when people are so concerned with everything in terms of um, uh, identity politics, in terms of race, they uh, it, not knowing that much about American history can look at the colonial period and say, oh, well, it's all white people. It's like, yes, there are white people whose grandparents, parents, maybe even they fought in religious wars back in Europe, um, were at each other's throats in the North. And then you had slave owning merchants in the, in, in the South. It, it was a weird cacophony of dissimilar people who, um, if, in some cases, if you had them in the same room together, would hate each other's guts. So it wasn't as if it was, there was no, it, no. it, it was peace, peaceful, like, you know, lilies and flowers for everybody. And people really kind of miss the religious part of it too, because, you know, you, the idea that it takes a lot of genuine commitment to tolerance to really be like, listen, I think your idea is going to send you and your, your family to hell. Um, but at the same time, I will be a citizen with you and we will go and we will hear each other out and all that kind of stuff. So the First Amendment, you know, sometimes there's a tendency among historians to refer to the French Revolution as the radical revolution and the American Revolution as the conservative revolution. And to a degree, that's justified. I mean, the, the French Revolution went entirely off the rails um, in, 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 in unfortunately spectacular ways. But I, I, but I do bristle a little bit at people talking about uh, the American Revolution as being conservative. Because if you look at the seven, in, in the old sense, not, not, not in the political sense, conservative in the sense of being like not, not radical. But if you look at the First Amendment, you know, it protects freedom uh, of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to petition your government, um, uh, freedom to, to assemble. Uh, and a lot of times they call it the religion clause, which I don't like. It's two separate things. One is you have the freedom to exercise your religion as you see fit, and most um, arguably, uh, as importantly, that the state cannot impose a religion or, or cannot even establish um, its, own, its own religion. And we take this for granted now, but think about the world that the founding fathers were coming yeah. from. They were saying, these are now going to be things that we no longer spill blood over. We're not going to spill blood over opinion, over press, over assembly, over religion, um, or your freedom from religion. This is a radical, positive step in, in, in human history, and, and it's embodying the First Amendment. And it's so radical that many of us have to choose what clause of the First Amendment um, we, we, we defend. So I'm, I'm not as well versed in, in, the, in the religion aspect, um, but the, the free speech aspect of it has been so crucial to the development of every, uh, you know, of, of not every, but um, in the, certainly in the 20th century, it's why uh, we were able to have a civil rights movement and a gay rights movement and a women's rights movement. It was, and why did that take so long? It's partially, unfortunately, because in, it wasn't until 1925 
1965 um, that the Supreme Court started taking seriously, the First Amendment had real implications for the states themselves through the 14th Amendment, which came after the Civil War. It's a little bit complicated. Um, but when you look at what free speech has done, um, I have to go and, and when I speak on campus, and, and I always really, uh, uh, forgive me for talking a little bit longer on this, um, this is a really important point that people seem to miss. Um, and because the way I feel like a generation is being miseducated about it. Uh, wealth and power have always been protected um, in human society. Uh, what are they protected by? They've been protected by wealth and power. Wealth and power protects itself. And so that's all of human history. Once you start having um, democracy, then 51% uh, protects you as well. So we now have a state where the wealthy and powerful are still protected. The majority now have power too. But what we were recognizing in the First Amendment and in the Bill of Rights was that we didn't want to live in a country where every four years or every year, depending on like whether you think Congress or president to be more important, um, that the minority gets completely beaten up um, and jailed yeah. and put away by, by the majority. Um, so freedom of speech, First Amendment, only exists to protect minority points of view and uh, minority yes. religions, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you have a generation of people who have been educated in an environment where the political um, uh, the, the political leaning is so lopsided in the other direction, they've actually been miseducated to believe that free speech is about um, tyranny. It's about, it, it's about, um, it's about the, the rule of the majority. It's like, no, it's the exact opposite. And the only reason why um, this generation can't see it is because universities will not admit, to, to be frank, their own privilege. Yeah, I get that precisely. I think it's an incredibly important point. Free speech is there to protect the little people, not the privileged and the powerful. And this is one of the great problems I think we have. In an age like ours, the problem is that the people who have the cultural heft don't think it's an issue because they're not feeling constrained. They're patting one another on the back saying, we're right, we've got the power. To go back to the framing of that constitution, I take your point that leaving behind the ugliness uh, of um, much of what had happened in Europe uh, was probably very much in the minds of the framers of the constitution. And you think of Alexander Hamilton in particular worried about mob rule. How do we restrain mob rule? But I just test a thesis with you. I've always thought though that the essential, um, I suppose you'd say Christian concept that each individual has worth and dignity but is fallible was also very prominent in their thinking. You see, this is the counter to the problem of life is a battle between good people and bad people. There was a recognition that no one had a monopoly on either. Uh, and, and that seems to me to be one of the things that we are losing that was unique to the Judeo-Christian influenced West this unique understanding that every individual has worth and dignity, uh, but at the same time is fallible. As one American put it, Americans are so good we had to give ourselves the vote. Americans are so bad we had to give ourselves the vote. It captures that dual aspect. So w this is important to understand as our society unravels and we're confronted now by the rise again of communism, where of course the good people are the people who are in power. They determine what's right and wrong and everybody else falls into line. It's a very different and very dangerous doctrine and should force us surely to re-examine our own roots because we find their massive wisdom and insight bought at the expense of great learning, great study, but also a proper reading of history. Yeah. Well, I, I talk about this a lot. I mean, it, clearly my, like my last name is Russian. Um, my great great grandfather was a serf. Uh, we were we would have been labeled kulaks um, because we were uh, people. We were peasants who made good, owned land, were doing actually quite well at the time of uh, the of, of the First World War. So I have a lot of family experience with um uh, with the issue of you know communism versus liberalism, small li liberalism, and this is the way I, I have ended up having to explain it um, to people who who. Um, feel warm and fuzzy about uh, that, which is amazing to actually have to deal with as an adult. But the uh, the founders of the, U of, uh, of the US created a system that will still work even if people were miserable jerks. Like they, they assumed, they wanted to create a system that could deal pretty effectively with human flaws. So that's one of the reasons why um, they wanted democracy, but they didn't want 
mob rule. Um, they wanted uh, power uh, to be divided because of bias. Uh, all these things that, yep. that a lot of times when you talk to people on, coll on college campuses, they think we just came up with these ideas. It's like, no, the, the founding fathers were incredibly clever in the ways that they divided up being uh, power and uh, created checks and balances because of people could be both wonderful and uh, and terrible. And so there's an optimism and a little bit of realism. I, I don't. I even hesitate to call it cynicism about human nature uh, that's inherent in, in in our constitutional system. Meanwhile, communism was predicated on the idea that people could be angels. People, people that, that that at least the model mm. citizen would be um, would be. Uh, they'd subject themselves. They'd give themselves over to the morality of the state, and become sort of the perfect proletariat. And the problem with that is, is that if you assume people are angels, it actually creates a situation in which there's tremendous incentive to be evil, um, to, to actually be the one who doesn't have to play by the rules. And so it wasn't a coincidence that you saw this incredibly cynical um, uh, situation going on. Because if, if someone, and I don't think it was a coincidence, you had people like Stalin, sociopaths, who were essentially like, well, you know, if you guys are all bound by all these like little, little rules, um, I don't have to be. And so I think it created, uh, you know, for for generations of Russians, a, a really messed up sense sense of morality. Meanwhile, they thought over here in the U.S. it was just all evil capitalism and 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 all stabbing each other in the back. But it actually turns out that with a good system of laws, with a good system of checks and balances, with with a system of uh, mar market friendly economies where people are actually trying to have transactions with each other, it actually encourages a sense of like, oh, actually, it's uh, on me to be trustworthy. It's on my uh, to be diligent, to be all of these kind of things that um, uh, don't that currently don't get enough sort of credit and understanding, like the, the fostering of trust, for example, how, how essential the, the fostering of trust uh, it has been. In, uh, in an American commercial success, for example, or for that um, is something that's badly underappreciated. Yeah, and I understand and, and I, I strongly concur with what you're saying. Uh, indeed, um, I wonder how many people today could, have, could write with the depth of experience and insight and the eloquence and I don't claim to have read anything like all of them, but I've read snippets of them, of the so-called Federalist Papers, many of them written by Alexander Hamilton. They are amazing. And I think we are incredibly smug when we think, oh, it all just happened, and now I can be an activist and get my way uh, and not worry about actually being a positive contributor to society. I'll use democracy without understanding what democracy is. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.